This chapter is going to be a bit technical, and I agree that it is not really necessary to know the entrails of recursion for using it. That is why we introduce transfinite recursion rather by examples instead of analyzing it on the formal level. On the other hand, understanding recursion from a more formal perspective is quite an essential part of set theory. It forms the bridge between the two roles of the set theory. And I'm going to use transfinite recursion in a non-trivial way in the last two chapters. So even though you could understand them without knowing the inside of the recursion, this chapter should help you reduce the feeling that the proofs there are based just on hand-waving. In this chapter we are going to take a very close look at the proof of a simple observation we've made in chapter 4. We took an ordered set and a non-empty terminal segment in it, such that no element of the terminal segment is the smallest. We want to prove that it is possible to find an infinite decreasing sequence in such a terminal segment. The proof was quite straightforward. We started with any element of the terminal segment. It is not the first one, so we can go below, and again, and again, and so on, until we construct the entire infinite decreasing sequence. But infinite proofs are not allowed. Even though we are investigating an infinite world, we can use only a finite number of steps for proving its properties. This could be surprising, but let's take the proof of Cantor's theorem as an example. It is the theorem from chapter 2, stating that whenever we assign infinite sequences of zeros and ones to natural numbers, there must be a sequence we have missed. The proof goes about as follows. Look at all the elements at the diagonal, that is one step. Make a new sequence from them, that is the second step. And finally invert it. In three steps we've constructed a sequence that is not assigned to any natural number. On the formal level we should convert these steps into using axioms, but here I just wanted to demonstrate the idea that we can apply mass operations to infinite sets. But how could we use mass operations to emulate a gradual construction of a decreasing sequence? How can we deal with the fact that it is essentially an infinite process? We need to be more clever. Instead of recursion we use induction. Induction is a proof technique working as follows. We prove that the statement is true for n equals zero. And if the statement is true for some natural number n, it is also true for n plus one. When this is done, we can deduce that the statement is true for all the natural numbers. In our case, we are going to prove that there is a decreasing sequence with n steps. For sure, there is a sequence with zero steps that is a single point from our set. Whenever we have a decreasing sequence of length n, the last element cannot be the smallest one, so we find a sequence of length n plus 1. Using induction we deduce that our statement is true for all natural numbers. I know, it still looks like infinite proof. First we get the length 1 from length 0, in the second step we get the length 2 from length 1 and so on. The trick is that there is also another view on induction. The mathematical induction can be phrased as an ordinary proof by contradiction. Take omega, the set of all the natural numbers, and ask every natural number, dear numbers, is there a decreasing sequence of your length? This is a single operation, in particular the axiom of separation splits omega into the numbers that answered yes and the numbers which answered no. 0 says yes, 1 says yes, 2 says yes, but it is possible that any number somewhere in the back answered negatively? Let's assume it happened and turn such a case into contradiction. If there is no decreasing sequence of length 678, there cannot be even any longer decreasing sequence. This means that we can find the negative answer in a non-empty terminal segment of omega, whereas the complementary initial segment answered positively. However, the set of natural numbers is well ordered, so we can find the first number n which answered no, whereas all the previous numbers including n minus 1 answered yes. That leads us to a contradiction. If the number n minus 1 answered yes, also the number n must have answered yes. We have already proven this. So we have reached a contradiction after finitely many steps. 
so the assumption was incorrect and all the numbers must have answered yes. So there is a decreasing sequence of every natural length. It is tempting to say that we are done and we have an infinite decreasing sequence, but it would be incorrect. The use of induction instead of recursion took its price. We are missing a limit step. Using the induction, we've obtained a decreasing sequence of every finite length. But the picture doesn't have to look exactly like this. First, we have to realize that there doesn't have to be just one decreasing sequence of a given length. There is not just a single decreasing sequence of length 4, there is an entire set of decreasing sequences of length 4. And the same is true for every length. For every length, there is a family of decreasing sequences. We want all of these families at once, so we use the axiom of replacement. The natural numbers form a set, so also all the families of different lengths form a set. Now we use the axiom of choice, it takes a single element from each family. So we get a set having a single decreasing sequence of every finite length. But what now? The axiom of choice could have chosen the sequences arbitrarily. There is no guarantee that the sequences are going to be compatible. That is a fundamental problem. Just because we have a decreasing sequence of every length, it is not guaranteed that there will be an infinite decreasing sequence. Take the ordinal omega plus 1 as an example. This ordinal contains a decreasing sequence of length 1 or length 5 or of any other finite length, but since it is an ordinal number, there is no infinite decreasing sequence in it, no matter where we land with the first jump. So our incautious use of induction discarded so much information that we are not able to finish the proof. That's not the way to go. However, it is not fair to blame just induction. The trouble we got into was caused by the incautious induction, but also by the indeterminacy here. The sequences can be incompatible just because there are various options on where to continue at every step. It wouldn't happen if there were strict rules. Take real numbers as an example and strict rules how to construct the decreasing sequence. We start on the number 4 and we jump from every number to its half. So the one element sequence goes from 4 to 4 divided by 2, that is 2. The sequence with two steps goes first from 4 to 2 and then to 1 and so on. If we now take the set of all the sequences of a finite length, they have to be compatible thanks to the strict rules. So we can take their union using the axiom of union and obtain an infinite decreasing sequence. This idea leads to a solution even when the ordered set is not the set of all real numbers. We just have to figure out how to make the process determinable even if we work with a general setup. The trick is to use the axiom of choice not after the induction, not during it, but before we even launch it. Given a general ordered set without the first element, for every point there are plenty of options where to go below it. So we imagine all the points of the set in individual lines and in every row we draw all the options of where to go below. Now we use the axiom of choice and we pick one such option for each point. We declare the resulting set as our rules. Furthermore, we fix a single point to start with. So when we are constructing the sequence now, we always start with the prescribed jump and continue with further compatible prescribed jumps. Now we can use mathematical induction, that is the proof by contradiction, and prove that given a finite length, there is exactly one sequence of that length following our rules. The axiom of replacement provides us with the set of all such finite decreasing sequences. And since the sequences are constructed uniquely, hence compatible, we can apply the axiom of union and construct an infinite decreasing sequence. And that's it. That is the formal proof that every non-empty ordered set without the first element contains an infinite decreasing sequence. Well, at least these are the main steps of the formal proof which can be animated. But it was a bit technical this time with a few dead ends, so let's summarize what has happened. When we want to construct a sequence recursively, we use mathematical induction to prove that there are sequences of all the possible lengths. The proof by induction is actually proof by contradiction. If there were no sequences of some length, 
we find the smallest such length and reach a contradiction. Notice that this shows that we don't necessarily need the set of natural numbers for this step. It could work on any well-ordered set if we defined how to prolong an infinite sequence. Since we need a sequence of length omega, we can think of it as using induction on the set omega plus 1. This means that the last step in the induction is the limit construction of an infinite sequence. However, to make such a limit step work, we need the decreasing sequence to be uniquely determined. We can ensure such determinism by applying the axiom of choice before launching the induction. This entire machine is called the transfinite recursion with choice and mathematicians typically use it without caring about the insight since its usage is more intuitive than its formal meaning. But it is good to know that the transfinite recursion is not just built on sand. In the next chapter, we will see this machine in practice. We will be finally able to prove that every two sets are comparable and we will get famous set theoretical tools known as Zorn's lemma and the well-ordering principle. See you then!